Hey, it's Melina, and you're watching Girl in the Verse, the video podcast, where we explore the exciting world of decentralized technology and the people driving its innovation. What the F is an NFT, and why do they matter? What about cryptocurrency or Web3? How will this affect me? If you've ever asked yourself these questions, know that you are not alone. With so much to learn about crypto, I questioned everything from owning a digital wallet to minting NFTs to dealing with gas fees and so much more. Whether you're a seasoned crypto veteran or just getting started on your journey in Web3, this podcast is for you. Today, we are sitting down with the artist who indirectly designed my logo, the PFP that has become the face of my brand, not to mention she kind of looks like me. Sarah Bauman is the artist and founder of Women and Weapons. This is going to be a fun conversation about how Sarah started her journey in this space, an occupational therapist who quit everything thanks to these NFTs. We also chat about the future of Women and Weapons, the brand, and my new favorite sassy influencer, Nova. As always, if you dig this episode, please let me know on social media. You can find me, tag me, at Girl in the Verse. I love saying hi to you. I love chatting with you in the DMs. Okay, let's dive right in. <laughs> I wore my curly hair in, uh, in a nod to you today. So, curly girls today. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate you a lot, obviously. Um, I, you know, I'm just so excited to have you here today. Truthfully, I am um, in the midst of rebranding, you know, my podcast and where I'm going, right? Like, I really want to take take this girl in the verse wherever she's going. So I'm so happy that you're, you're technically my first, first, first guest. Ah! And I, I couldn't think of someone more fitting, right? Aww. Like, I... Really, truthfully, Sarah, I really appreciate you a lot. Um, but I do want to start this right away. I wanted to start maybe maybe by talking about you, how you started in this space. You know, occupational therapist turned, you know, well, I won't say turned artist because you were always an artist, but turned this new passion into a business now. So talk to me about how you started when and how this all came about. Yeah. So, uh, like you said, occupational therapist that was like moonlighting as an artist, essentially, uh, trying to get my like social media posts of my artwork out, like in between patient lunch breaks. Um, but yeah, that had always been my passion being an artist. Um, you know, I ended up going into the healthcare field because it was, you know, the more sustainable field and kind of the, the more sustainable field pressured by my mom, who's an immigrant that, you know, I think she really saw that it was important for me to have a sustainable career path. Um, and so went into occupational therapy. Uh, my husband actually started telling me about the NFT space in early, early 2021, uh, especially as I was working on my women and weapons gouache painted the 10 piece collection. And he was like, you should really get into the NFT space and learn about this. Like, I think it could be really important for your artwork and you know how overwhelming it was last year. Right. Um, so I was like, yeah, I'll delve into it. I'll start looking into it. I'll learn about it. Uh, I would say it took a couple of interactions before I really started delving into it and learning about it. Um, once I did, I want to say it was like early summer of 2021, and I really started falling in love with the community, the people, and really started seeing the opportunities that the technology in the space would offer to not only artists, but, you know, a lot of creators. Um, and so it's a good time. It's a good time for you to start going into this full time. And, uh, of course, when Gary bought those pieces, like something in my gut was like, go girl, like go. Um, and I did. And so worked all day in the hospital, came home, made art afterwards, uh, minted out the 10,000 piece women and weapons collection, went down to PRN at the hospital, which means like as needed. Um, and officially quit the hospital in January. And like you said, you know, what was it like overall, like mentally, it, it feels weird leaving your, your team of therapists, you know, we work PT, OT, speech all in one department. And then the rest of the hospital is also our team. And it feels weird. 
Um, but at the same time, like I knew I was chasing my passions. Um, I knew that they were going to find somebody fantastic to replace me. Um, but I knew that this is what I really, really wanted. I had served my purpose as an occupational therapist, but now was my time to serve my purpose as an artist. I love that. Um, obviously I want us to talk about women and weapons. I can't tell you how many people, you know, ever since I changed my PFP to, to my women and weapons, you know, people ask me, oh my God, did you draw that? And then I'm just there like, no, <laughs> this is part of the bigger <laughs> collection, <laughs> uh, right? So talk to me, like for those who really don't know, you know, women and weapons, what is women and weapons? Yeah, uh, there's there's a lot of, you know, kind of undertones associated with women and weapons. And I, I do really encourage people who are uh, interested in the artwork to kind of, uh, take what they can from the artwork and, and communicate about it. Right. Um, and you know, develop your own inferences from it. But, uh, one of the heaviest pieces is, you know, I'm taking these women from a, an era where they weren't perceived as powerful, that mid-century era, um, where we saw a lot of advertisements that were oftentimes putting women down. Um, and I wanted to take these women and portray them as powerful, almost portray them as superhero esque with the utilization of their weapons as the weapons that women carry into their every day. Um, whether that be, you know, our empathy, our intelligence, our motherhood, whatever it might be. Um, and so that's really what set off the collection. But like I said, there's lots that can be taken from the collection, a lot of communication that I think can be had from the collection as well. And uh, I'm a big believer in communication uh, can be a big driver of what changes our culture and our mindsets. What got me into the, into the art and what really attracted myself, um, because I did not mint women and weapons. You know, when I entered the space, I think you had already minted out, truthfully. I had just entered the space. But what really what attracted me to, to, to this, to your, to the 10,000 PFP collection was this notion of women and how far we've come and, you know, the baggage that we have or that we've carried generations upon generations, right? It's not just, you know, girl in the verse as the 30 year old, you know, it's, it's what my grandmother lived through, you know, what, yeah. what my ancestors lived through and, and you, you, how can I say this? Like you just, you delivered it. So, I, I mean, I understood it right away. I mean, it was my, one of my first NFTs that I, that I purchased, but it just, it attracted me because the message for myself, it made sense. And it made sense to, you know, like what I always say is like an ode to women. You know, when I, when yeah. I built Girl in the Verse, it was, it was about helping people, women specifically, to understanding that we've come a long way. There's yes. still a lot more work to be done, but we've come a long way and let's celebrate that as well, right? Yes, 150%. Um, I think that there's a lot that can be taken. And, you know, also it's, it's kind of a representation, I feel like, not just of the strength of women, the power of women, but also a bit of a representation of like, you know, women that don't fit into the societal norms box, right? Like I'm, it, I'm one of those women. Like I love freaking fast and furious and dirt biking. And like, you know, I didn't start wearing dresses until I was like out of college basically. Um, so I'm, I'm probably not one of those women that fits inside of the typical box that societal norms place upon us. And, uh, I feel like that's certainly another undertone with the collection as well. Now I want to obviously start talking about Nova right? Yeah. Like she's my baby as well. <laughs> she's, she's the whole women and weapons community's baby, basically. She's, she's so sassy and vibrant. And I already like, I can, I can capture a few things just based off of, you know, the little snippets we've, we've, we've gotten so far. Talk to me about, about, you know, creating Nova and really where are we going with Nova? Like what's, you know, what was the, what were you thinking behind creating this sort of character here? Yeah. Um, well, I will tell you, initially, there's a lot that went into creating Nova. I mean, from creating her character profile, who she is, what she likes, what she dislikes, what is her voice going to sound like? How is she going to talk? Um, all of that was planned out. But she is a fully rigged 3D animated character, rigged for motion capture. Um, and so basically, she's going to be living on a lot of our social media video platforms or vertical platforms like YouTube shorts, like TikTok, like Instagram reels, 
Twitter as well. Um, and you know, one of the things that I've said from the very get go of women and weapons is that I really want to bring our characters to life. Um, and I really want to showcase the strength of our IP. Um, and so Nova is going to be able to educate people about web three in kind of a Trojan horse manner. Um, she's going to be able to meet people where they are. You know, I think right now in web three, we do a lot of our communication within Twitter and within discord and, at that point, it becomes a bit of an echo chamber. You know, I think we're, we're starting to need to branch out and kind of grow outside of just the few social media and communication platforms that we're utilizing, right? And so with Nova, she's going to be able to be a, you know, a non-extractive sustainable source for us uh, that's going to allow her to partner with brands and grow and hopefully that's going to bring more people into the women and weapons ecosystem, bring more eyes upon the women and weapons ecosystem and brand. And hopefully that's going to do well for holders as well. What's your favorite part about creating her? First of all, it's your voice. Yes, it is um, my voice. <laughs> you know, what's, what's so funny is we were going to use a different voice and everybody was like, Sarah, I really like your voice for Nova. And I was like, that's so weird, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can we can talk about hearing each other speak. You know, that's one of the things that, you know, I create content all the time, but I hate rewatching my work because it's so cringy. You're like, I don't want to hear. That's myself. how I feel, too. I totally understand. I, I get it. But what's it like, you know, now, now that you've been given this this role of like bringing her to life with your voice? Right. What's what's that been like? You know, it's actually kind of an interesting way of like reframing your brain, honestly, like. I've come to realize that whenever I am portraying Nova, I am quite literally in character as Nova. Like I'm not acting like myself, I'm acting like Nova, right? And then whenever I go back to watch the things that Nova has done and said and so on, it's like I'm watching a character on television. Like I feel like I don't have that attachment to her as myself. You know, I, I have this recognition of her as her own independent entity. And so it's very different from like seeing myself on an interview or on a social media post or whatever. This feels totally separate, totally independent. Like she is her own being essentially. What made you want to choose a character from season two? Or was this something you were thinking about while creating season two? You know, what, what was that, um, take us through that whole behind the scenes. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's a really good question. So um, there's a lore attached to the kind of transition from season one to season two, and you can find that at our website, uh, womenandweapons.io. Um, and so with the transition from season one to season two, these women are essentially becoming these kind of like superhuman characters, right? And, and there's, with the story development, I kind of mishmashed uh, the Radium Girls story, the women working in factories during World War II, and the space race to develop the story. Um, and with our season two characters, they're a little bit more of like a retro futuristic vibe, kind of that like retro futurism that we saw in the 1960s and so on. Um, and I just felt like there was a little bit more that could be played with in regards to storytelling with the artwork from season two. And that's why I decided to go with the season two character. Also, I really like the purple hair. So that was another kind of factor, I guess, in that. But um, yeah, the ray guns for sure sold me. The retro futurism for sure sold me. And I was like, this is this is where we go with the storyline. Would Sparky ever dye her hair purple? Sparky, well, I mean, I have a little purple in my hair. I remember Sparky, you having some purple, yeah. Yeah, but the problem is, is I'm like a Iranian brunette, which means that if I bleach my hair, all of my hair is going to fall out. So I will probably be a purveyor of wigs if I ever want to have purple hair. I think that there's just no chance uh, that I would be able to get my whole head purple without it all just breaking off and <laughs> dissipating into the ether. <laughs> it's so funny because even when I was going through, um, you know, which women and weapons I wanted, I remember everyone saying, I love the pink hair. I love the purple hair, right? Especially the first collection. But I went with the black, like I went with the, I was like, I wanted to kind of look like me. So it's funny that you, you talk about, I, you know, if I had purple hair, one of my favorite social media apps continues to be Instagram. Um, I say this publicly, you know, I, I get a lot of people like, what do you mean? Why not TikTok? But I love Instagram because I really do think it is the platform that helps creators create. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, obviously I dive in into all the platforms, but all the social media platforms, but Instagram continues to be my favorite. 
obviously I was a little jealous on my end because I, well, jealous, proud and jealous. Um, <laughs> seeing you, you know, you as one of the first NFT artists to be able to sell NFTs using Instagram. What was that like? Man, you know, uh, likewise, I really, really love Instagram. I've loved Instagram since it like came about basically I've been using it since then. Um, but they have been an incredible team to work with and it was bonkersville USA, um, being able to be like one of the first creators to sell on that platform. I mean, shoot, uh, Amber and I, we, we dropped our pieces around the same time and both of us, I mean, just sold out in seconds and it was like shocking how easy the process was both to drop our pieces onto Instagram, but also to purchase because while I was dropping my piece, I was also working on, on buying Amber's piece. And I was just like, this is too easy. I'm going to get into a lot of trouble with this. Um, but yeah, I'm super excited that they're rolling out this feature. And, uh, I think that they've done it really, really well. Um, I think people are really going to enjoy being able to utilize this feature and going to be extremely shocked at how user-friendly it is, especially in an ecosystem where the barriers are quite high. Yeah. And I, I want us to dive into that in a sec, but I also wanted to talk about, you're also launching with Coinbase, right? Like there's so much that you're doing. Talk to me about this. This Is it a partnership with Coinbase? How does that look? Yeah. So it's, it's essentially a partnership with, uh, with Coinbase. I'm one of their inaugural creators that's going to be launching with Coinbase. Um, and so that's actually coming out. I can officially say it January 13th are, are my pieces coming out, uh, which is the Royal. Look what Army. I have Sarah, just for in case I'm so slow, but in case someone would ever be like, I can officially say something. Oh, ah! look at you. Look at you pulling in that newscaster background, I know. <laughs> reporter background. Well done. Dun, so dun, dun, dun. when, when are you launching? Uh, January 13th, Friday the 13th. Um, because I mean, pff, how could you not pick Friday the 13th? Right. <laughs> um, and so this is going to be for my Royal rebels collection that I've been working on for like, I feel like eons now. Um, and so it's going to be, my 10 piece gouache painted collection. Uh, it is most likely going to be an open edition mint. Um, and I'm super stoked for it. I really, you know, I haven't done another gouache painted collection since the original women and weapons, um, because they take a long time to paint. Uh, so I'm really excited to be launching this. Sarah, now that I have you here as well, I also wanted to, to talk about you. Cause I always think about, you know, when we, when we talk about onboarding more people, right? Like mm -hmm. how do we get people who are only on Instagram right now, who, yeah. who are only on TikTok, right? Or, or who are only, you know, consuming content on YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. How do we get these people to understand what we're degenning about, right? And I, like a lot of my friends think I'm weird. They're like, what are you doing? This is yeah. so like not, like, not like you, right? What would you tell someone who doesn't understand, I will say the potential of yeah. crypto NFTs web three, what would you tell someone? Um, well, first and foremost, I would tell them that, you know, the people who were gung ho on the internet probably got the same type of heat. Um, and clearly the internet turned out to be something pretty darn cool. Um, but what I would tell those people is, you know, anytime you get an intersection of so many just brilliant individuals from various backgrounds, such as creative art, tech, finance, you know, media, so on, you're going to build something really exciting and really cool. Um, I think we're in our very, very early stages of what Web3 is eventually going to be, um, which means, of course, we're going to be hitting some bumps and some bruises. But I think that those bumps and those bruises are important for identifying where we need to uh, build and grow and create and innovate. Um, and so I think that the utilization of this technology is eventually going to be something that we see into our daily lives that we may not even realize that we're actually using in our daily lives. Um, so I think right now it's, it's hard to onboard people because there's a lot of jargon. It's very confusing. It's hard to really, um, explain it in a very linear way because I feel like it does break off into so many different webs. Right. Um, 
But, you know, eventually when people are ready to start learning about it and looking into it and seeing what possibilities they are, they will. And I think that they'll probably appreciate the technology and the possibilities that are behind it. But right now uh, it's it's confusing. And I remember with like our hospital system, we used to have to do continuing education and uh, health stream. If anybody else in, is listening that's from the healthcare field, I'm sure you hate health stream just as much as I do. Um, but one of the courses that we used to have to take was talking about um, change in behavior and the various stages of change in behavior. And you're going to have your early adopters, you're going to have your skeptics, you're going to have your pure naysayers. Um, there's always going to be kind of like a gradient of individuals that are willing to hop on the bandwagon immediately, people that are going to need a little bit more talking into it, and people that are probably never going to hop on that bandwagon. Um, so we just need to give it time, I think, but continue to educate people in a very digestible way as to what the possibilities are. I always say you and Jake are probably my favorite couple in the space. <laughs> I say that all the time. I'm like, thank you. Archie and Jake are my favorite couple. You know, it's like if we would open like US Weekly, I, I'd be wanting to know like, like when is baby coming? You know, like, <sighs> you know, like that type of stuff. I'm, I'm just like, what's going on with them? Right. And how is it working with hubby? Um, you know, because I feel like that's, it could be tricky at times. How is that working? Yeah. No, I, you're totally spot on about, you know, for it's not for everybody that's for no. sure but you know Jake and I have been together for almost 20 years now we've been together wow. since we were 12 years old um and he and I have always been very much attracted to each other but also very different like you know he was the jock and I was the nerdy art girl and like people were like that's a really weird relationship and we were like but it works um and I feel like that's kind of been the same in regards to like our, our working relationship as well. Like what he's really, really good at, I usually suck at. And what I'm usually really good at, he usually sucks at. And so we kind of fill each other's gaps and also have our own lanes. But despite having our own lanes, we also have that capability to really bounce ideas and thoughts and communicate with one another. Um, and so I don't have just my own perspective or just the perspective of somebody that's an artist, but I also have his perspective, someone who's, you know, much more skilled in the business realm um, and vice versa. So, you know, he and I have knock on wood fit together like a puzzle piece in regards to building out a, a company and a brand. It's been cool. That's awesome. Do you, do you, do you guys ever get, so it happens to me often, right? Like my partner is very supportive, you know, and, and I'm sure you know, this probably your mother, you know, everyone around you is giving you tips and ideas. Like you should do it like this. It should be like that. You know, D is there ever a time in the day where you're like, okay, now we're going to not talk business. We're going to, you know, like what's yeah. your favorite color, you know, like, let's go back into like <laughs> our relationship. How does that Absolutely. work? Yeah. It's so funny because I'm the person who's probably constantly thinking about business. Like I, I have a hard time turning it off and Jake will be like, put your phone down. Let's eat dinner. Let's talk about the cats or the weather or whatever. <laughs> but yeah, I, you know, we, we try to be really good about like making sure we take breaks from business and, you know, enjoy just life. Um, and so we're purveyors of frequent, frequent walks, uh, purveyors okay. of a good television show here and there. Okay, Sarah, what else can you say? Any closing thoughts? Um, you know, I always have in mind, you know, when I, when I started doing all of this and in terms of what I'm, what I'm doing, um, I always think about the person who doesn't get what we're doing, you know, yeah. um, what would you tell someone who's even thinking about, or, you know, an artist right now who, who happens to watch this and is like, how do I start? You know, yeah. What would you tell someone right now who's who's trying to figure out a way to get in this Web three ecosystem. Yeah, I. You know what I tell them? I tell them I know it can be really hard. It's it's hard figuring out where that starting point is. Um, but jump into YouTube, start googling or searching like what is an NFT, what is Web three. Uh, jump on Twitter Spaces, listen to marvelous humans like Girl in the Verse and, you know, Rug Radio and things like that, that, that offer, um, you know, maybe not education in regards to what is Web3, but you can at least hear like what's happening in the space, what's trending. And whenever you're hearing those things, that's going to spur you on to go Google something and learn about something. Um, I also think there's, there wasn't last year as much education out there as to what the space is and how it works. Now there's 
exponentially more education out there. Um, and so follow, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk, head to YouTube, start Googling what is Web3, uh, jump into some Twitter spaces and just listen. Spend like a solid 50 hours of just literally listening, uh, taking in information, reading through Twitter, scrolling through OpenSea, searching things that you find intriguing, um, and you're going to learn. But also be safe. Um, that's another thing that if you're going to start learning about the spaces, learning about how you can be safe with what it is you're doing. If ever you're trying to mint a project and you're having a hard time and OpenSea customer support reaches out to you on Twitter, please don't engage with them or MetaMask customer support. Please don't engage with them. Make good choices. Don't give anybody your keys or your, or your, uh, your seed phrase or any of that nonsense. Um, but yeah, look for information. There's plenty of free information out there. Thank you so much, Sarah. You're super welcome, sister. I adore you. You're incredible. Thank I you. couldn't give you more kudos, to be honest. You're a marvelous individual, and Thank your PFP you. really is you, for sure. And now, Sarah and I would love to hear from you. What is the best way to onboard more people in this space? Let us know by commenting down below. As always, if you dig this episode, let me know in the comments. You can also find me on social media at Girl in the Burst. I love chatting with you in the DMs. Let's keep this conversation going. I will see you next time.